high-powered vehicle revolution. Let's seize the moment in the hottest sector in the world right now. Visit CrushTheStreet.com slash win. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri, and I got a special treat for you today. Cliff High is on the line. Yes, the one and only Cliff High of HalfPastHuman.com, the man behind the WebBot report. And he creates these reports through what he calls predictive linguistics, collecting data from all over the Internet, all over the world. And he analyzes his data and is able to make some pretty accurate predictions of what is to come in the future. And one of those things that we're going to be talking about today, among other things, is Bitcoin. Eerily predictive of Bitcoin. We're going to talk about the election, precious metals, and even a coming Ice Age. Yes, uh, there's a lot of data on this, and Cliff is going to go into this detail. First of all, Cliff, hi. Thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for asking me. Very nice. <laughs> Sir, let's start off. You know, we have the election. I'm sorry, the inauguration here in a couple of days. And, you know, I'm just curious. What are you seeing right now with your data collection that might suggest anything that could potentially go on regarding this inauguration of Donald J. Trump? Um, it's kind of a, an interesting question for us because we get uh, I get the, the kind of question frequently, and I was asked about uh, whether or not we had assassination language and that sort of thing. And yes, we do, but it only because it's out there and um, being generally discussed in an open fashion. Now, our problem with that is that our my whole system works on uh, nuance. So um, the language around the inauguration is all um, uh, extremely emotionally intense one way or the other with very little gray area in between. And it's the gray area where we fish around and pull out any uh, prescient information about the future. So insofar as the language I have about assassination and all of that, I've got tons of it, but it's not meaningful within our system. Uh, uh, just because of what we call the propagation effect within the Internet, which I'm sure you're uh, aware of and suffer from, where you find your own videos being taken and propagated and redone years later, this sort of thing. It just keeps going and building, a, if you will, uh, an information pyramid underneath you that can be very distorting to our particular view of how uh, language forms and so on. So I don't have anything that, that alarms me relative to that. And what I do have, because our, because our system is more or less batch-oriented, where we gather a lot of data and then have to sit around and fish through it, like I say, um, and it's not a real-time system in that sense, uh, I have a view uh, from last month of the particular time we're in now that shows all kinds of chaos, uh, especially around the inauguration. And, of course, within the chaos, there's descriptions for, um, you know, buildings being closed and sewers opened and people uh, hurting themselves, all, all sorts of things. Most of it not um, uh, generally meaningful to us. And then I have the data that we're working now into the coming report that shows the Trump administration attempting to deal with the chaos of actually being in office. Ergo, we can make the assumption from our data sets that at least that part of the inauguration proceeds uh to its uh, expected conclusion. In spite of any other chaotic set of circumstances that may exist around it, the data shows that there's work being done by the Trump administration um, uh, in this current data set within what we call immediacy data. Immediacy data is effective in our system from um, almost really from the time I get it, but but when we write reports, I try and get it so it, I write a report and the, and the stuff doesn't actually show up for three days. Uh, this way everybody knows we're not just um, uh, easily fishing something off the Internet and putting it out before you've seen it. So our immediacy data goes from three days out to the end of the third week, and we've got all kinds of stuff in there for, you know, um, uh, contention, strife, uh, chaos, bad words, all this sort of stuff, all relating to Donald Trump. So, you know, um, the let's just say the generalized pain in the ass factor uh, continues steady on and, in fact, grows. Therefore, I don't see any reason to suppose that there's uh, any prescient language saying that anything untoward is going to happen. Make mm -hmm. sense? Oh, it, it sure does. And, you know, obviously, it's very interesting the way you, you do gather data and uh, how it how it shows to be true in, in so many instances and in one area in particular that I do want to touch on is you know Bitcoin. Bitcoin is super hot right now and the webbot has been eerily accurate uh, pointing out the, the moves that we have been seeing in, in Bitcoin and interestingly enough we the webbot has actually been uh, picking up language regarding Bitcoin as early as 2005. I noticed you put that in your, your last report. Uh, so if you would give us a recap 
on you know what the WebBot report had said about Bitcoin and you know how it it's been right about it. And I, I'd like to talk about where it's going from here. Uh, sure. Uh, Bitcoin's a weird kind of a subject, okay? Because when I first started doing this work in the um, early '90s, when I came up with the idea in 1993, um, and it firmed up in my head on the airplane ride back from the uh, earthquake in Mexico City, where I'd been doing some consulting. Uh, that was in September, I believe, probably September 11th of that year. And I was thinking about um, uh, this kind of stuff. And when I started running my first experiments, one of the things I tumbled to was the idea uh, coming out of the uh, early data experiments. Before I'd done anything, it was all proof of concept. And uh, But one of the things that came out was the idea that, that uh, time it was not as I always considered it. And one of the elements of that time was the ability to um, uh, be surprised, if you will, by uh, larger themes that come out of the data when you're looking for something specific. So this continued on even into 1997 when I ran my first full-blown trial because I'd had enough success with my proof of concept from 93 to 97 and it had taken me four years to write all the code. And so I run my first trial and within all of the other stuff in there that misdirected me because bear in mind I was setting up the system because I was going to try and game the emotional response of retail investors and get ahead of them, front run, if you will, on stock purchases. It was just something to do. I, I was interested in the concept and I needed a goal for it mm. other than just, you know, uh, because it had to be practical and I had to make a living off of it. So anyway, that was the idea. But so I was, I was focused on economics to start. But one of the things that came out was that, that I was going to see within the next few years an invention that would be analogous to, in terms of its emotional impact on the social order, uh, analogous to the uh, entertainment and radio of the Depression. Now, bear in mind what happened in the in the Depression. Radio became the technology and started draining away resources from uh, film. And, uh, and it was, uh, eventually evolved into, you know, its peak, which was, uh, CB radio in the 70s, which was a ubiquitous, distributed, uh, destructive to the existing technology kind of a system. So I had all those sorts of language showing back up again with a, a, um, no particular pinpoint. And then as we went along in the data, uh, in the process of growing the system and working out all of the, postulates and the corollaries and the principles and so on. Around 2005, I started getting hints of that uh, uh, soon-to-emerge part of that equation, which would be the invention component that would be, uh, as I say, analogous, would have the same emotional impact on the social order in general as radio and entertainment had had since the previous depression. And so I was on the lookout for it. And then 2009, uh, the white paper is released, and uh, being a coder, I read that and thought, boy, I could code the hell out of this. It'd be perfect to mine. And that was, uh, and then also I instantly knew that we'd solved the double spending issue, and therefore this was the invention, even if it looked like the flakiest thing anybody had ever seen. Uh, you know, you're talking about a distributed money, and in the, in the days of radio, at least radio sort of made sense in that it was a form of communication that people actually desired. Uh, when Bitcoin came out, there were very few people that actually realized, A, it was a new form of communication, and that B, people actually did desire this, and they would certainly need it in the future. So it was... Um, uh, the, the success I've had with Bitcoin, I put down to a couple of factors. The, the fact that I was aiming at a, an emotional um, uh, analysis system for stock markets, so it was, I was clued into the economic uh, to emotional links anyway, and was therefore able to um, uh, jump on it when it started emerging in late 2010, early 2011, with the linkages between uh, language sets that made Bitcoin uh, even in its nascent uh, one penny and, and you know, 10000 for a pizza and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. even at that stage, there were emotional links that tied it very closely to silver. In, in, and bear in mind, at that time, too, we had yet to reach the real uh, uh, peak point of silver, and silver had yet to penetrate in, in a broader sense to the greater understanding of the populace at large. So it was a, it's, also, it's also a niche market with a, a very uh, tight core of, uh, uh, well-informed aficionados, a smaller outer ring of people that are sort of aware of it as an investment greed, and then virtually nothing beyond that in the greater uh, population. Bitcoin, at least now, has moved away from that uh, definition in these past few years and is moving towards gold in terms of its emotional um, equivalency within the broader understanding uh, of the social order, our, our society, and the uh, language that that they um, hold in the emotional values. So and it would not surprise me in a couple of years to have Bitcoin equal to gold, no matter what the price of gold is, in a temporary state, simply because Bitcoin is emotionally now moving away from silver and, and 
has in its descriptor sets more of the language that we usually associate with gold. There's also another component of that, and that is that Bitcoin is uh, gold is uh, more well known than silver within our uh, USA population, from which I still derive the greater uh, amount of my Bitcoin uh, work. But uh, getting back to the eerily prescient component of this, and it's a very accurate um, uh, ability for forecast since uh, probably July of 2015, when Bitcoin was in the $200 range, that's when I started getting indications in the data that I should stop thinking of Bitcoin in terms of U.S. dollars and start thinking in terms of uh, RMB. And, oh, the yuan, the Chinese yuan. Right. And uh, at that point, the numbers started reconciling and making sense, and I was able to fine-tune my algorithms because I realized I was certainly picking up uh, greater emotional com uh, uh, complexity and uh, emotional sums from the Chinese spiders than I was from the English spiders, English-speaking spiders. Mm -hmm. And therefore, my uh, Chinese sampling uh, was turning out to be the um, uh, the better set to deal with. Again, that sort of makes sense? Sure. Um, so since 2015, yeah. we've essentially allowed the Chinese sets to dominate uh, what's going on with Bitcoin. And so China is really interesting because of the way their language works and their, the idioms that they speak in and their um, imagery. Their imagery is able to come through very easily, whereas tech speak is difficult to take through in our particular system. So we get a lot of flowery kind of language that translates very easily into Chinese and gives you an emotional uh, view that you can assign to time. And that's how we've been able to, to make these uh, predictions that are accurate in the patterns and get the patterns to within a couple of months of when we think they ought to start. Well, you know, I, I'd like to touch on that if you wouldn't mind. Um, you know, sure. 888 was a big point price target, 1088, you know, and then off to the 1488. You know, let's talk about some of these numbers and, you know, what you think might happen going forward here. Um, the data sets are showing, um, okay, so uh, d digits don't really come through. Uh, in our system, we throw them out. So, we use um, expressed uh, numerals that are spelled out numbers. And we get a lot of that in Chinese because of the way that their language is structured. They have a tendency to write the number out more than express the digit. And so this has been very good for our accuracy. I actually should have at one point said uh, it would go as high as 1130-ish before coming back down to, to 888 to hover around there. Um, it, it's difficult to know how much to provide in the reports because my audience is rather diverse. And so it's not just trading community guys that w are interested to know this, this amount on this date kind of a thing. We have people that are interested in the general trends and at a, a much larger, um, longer time frame. And so from, for Bitcoin, the data sets show that we have a certain number of days that are going to pop up in early February that, uh, will express a temporal echo to what we've just been through in terms of the uh, push on Bitcoin. So the there's a lot of prescient data within the Chinese spiders that suggest that the central authorities of China are in the process of preparing their population uh, for uh, a number of major economic um, uh, periods, not, not events, but periods of time. Bear in mind, the central authorities of China have to deal with, in a good year, 75,000 riots in which there are fatalities and destruction that equals at least $100,000, U.S. dollars, in damage. And many of the fatalities are in their uh, military try or their police trying to deal with it. So they have 70,000 of those in a good year, and they've not had too many good years in the recent uh, decade. And so they're very concerned about the economic well-being of the, of the populace, and they don't want them to um, be blindsided. Uh, so what they've been doing for these past number of years is encouraging their populace to shift into gold and silver at a personal level and encouraging institutions and corporations to think about a uh, dollar-absent world. And in doing so, they've let out all kinds of prescient language that now we're able to say, aha, the recent moves Chinese have been making, uh, central authorities have been making relative to the exchanges are, are forecasting or telling us um, that uh, China is about ready to adopt as a, and they, within the language we get this, as uh, the discarded nephew uh, Bitcoin. So, so the discarded nephew relates to um, a popular image within China in this um, epic tale that is one of their sort of creation stories called The Journey to the West. And within there, the discarded nephew is uh, the a person that is mentored and uh, taken along and to some extent is the um, uh, exposition within the story, the point of saying certain things to the audience. You say it through this particular character within that, stor that story. And so the implication is that the Chinese authorities are going to mentor 
Bitcoin and mature it. And uh, so this is, slides in with our uh, thinking that there's going to be uh, a period of echo here in early February that we'll see the rise of Bitcoin again in price, uh, which will uh, start off on um, uh, get us through this 1088 gate and um, and head us towards 1448. And in, in that getting there, there's going to be a bunch more of these crocodile teeth days where you'll go up a bunch and come down a bunch such that on the chart it ends up with all these little spiky things that are in a generalized uptrend. But within each and every day, you're going to get downs that may be, um, uh, take you down to the uh, lower than the previous day's close. But in general, the whole trend is upward. Um, I'm not a chartist, so I really don't know the terms to explain it other than that. Um, and uh, But the general trend upward will take us to where we're going to have these, um, uh, what we call strange attractors, because there, it's just, I have no explanation for them as to why Bitcoin should want to go from 408 to 428 three times in a particular pattern over, I think it was four months, and there it was done with it, and we've never seen 428 again. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to know why it behaved as it did in the 650s around 658, nor around 888. So we just call them strange attractors like the quant quantum physics guys do. And uh, because for whatever reason, Bitcoin does things and hovers around there. What we're doing now, according to the data, is we're defining the word dither, D-I-T-H-E-R, which uh, in one of its definition, you can dither around. That is to say, you can um, spend time uh, in an a activity, and it can be called dithering. Uh, there's a dither is also an interesting uh, word because it has a technical um, meaning, as in like the the bear dither or the Tompkins uh, heart dither, which are particular kinds of um, numeric algorithms for expressing things on the screen. But we're defining this word within Bitcoin. So when we leave 888 here and pass through 1088. We may bounce around 1088 for a couple of days, that sort of a deal, but likely not too long. And then we'll see the last of 1088. But I will then be able to go back, whatever day that is, and calculate the total number of days we've bounced around 888. And thereafter, for as long as it holds, I'll be able to, anytime we see the word dither applied to a particular price on Bitcoin, I'll be able to come back and say, aha, it's going to be this amount. Wow. Make sense? Well, I, I don't understand your system. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, to a degree, I do, but uh, it is incredible the way it has been able to to predict in these movements at the four hundred dollar range, six fifty, and then eight eighty eight, and uh, you know, going forward here, I'm very excited. I'm very excited in general about Bitcoin and and where it's going. And uh, you know, what, does any of your data suggest what Bitcoin's role is going to be going forward? With you know the governments, obviously a lot going on in China, central banks, uh, actual maybe the ushering in of a, another digital currency. What what are your thoughts on this? The data sets have Bitcoin with uh, very long legs, so going out decades. Um, and within that, within those sets, we have descriptors that appear as we shove our model space further and further out. Sometimes these descriptors are bringing back imagery that suggests that Bitcoin's going to be used to settle uh, very large accounts uh, between corporations and then ultimately uh, act as a um, uh, state-to-state or sovereign-to-sovereign -sovereign, uh, form of settlement. And it, the reason it will be able to be uh, used that way is because it's... Uh, global and because it basically everybody says bitcoin is not backed by anything but no it's really backed by all of the people on the planet and if you wanted to think about it a particular way it's a communication media before it's a, a form of exchange and then we call that exchange money and uh deal with it as though it were currency or specie in our hand and so it's a it's basically an abstraction that we all agree to and this particular abstraction has all kinds of benefits to us so um the data sets have Bitcoin as being a national settlement vehicle, and at that point, it's um, will have different names for decibits and millibits, the way we have different names for you know a dollar and pennies or a pound and pence, that right. kind of thing. Well, Bitcoin is a perfect transition over to uh, silver and gold, and in in the last report, you talked about a thousand dollar Bitcoin and uh, the impacts, how it will correlate, you know, with the price of silver. In gold, and I, again, I, I need you to explain it because uh, I, I know I didn't do it justice. So <laughs> please, please okay. elaborate it's, on that. It's, yeah, it's not. Um, it is indeed correlation. It's not cause and effect. So there's no direct causal link between Bitcoin and uh, uh, the big takeoff in silver and, and its gapping. Um, there are correlations. So uh, in deep data mining, which is basically what we do, and then add a prescience feature to it, uh, there's still the difference between uh, correlation and causation. So whatever it is that's going to prompt uh, the sudden inrush of um, uh, wealth 
into uh, Bitcoin will, will spill over into uh, silver and then gold. And we also see this beginning in China before we see it happening in the rest of the world. So I suspect that we may see a confluence of events in early February where the exchanges in China are vetted. That is to say, their gambling practices have been cleaned up by the state authorities, and these exchanges are on their way to becoming more like what we might think of as a depository bank, not a um, in what we have in the West as a bank, you know, that can gamble and buy stock and all of that, but rather the old-fashioned kind of a thing where all they did was the boring, mundane business of taking your deposit and handing you the cash when you needed it. And so I think that's the what China is going to do with their Bitcoin exchanges. In that same process, uh, they have been openly encouraging the purchase of silver, and I think that there will be some new mechanism whereby uh, silver will be able to be uh, more easily funneled into the Chinese population. Uh, I say that because we have long-term data sets that show a linkage between southern Mexico and China, where southern uh, Mexico will be supplying uh, 24 by 7 as much silver ore as they can possibly get out of the ground um, and shipped over to China. Uh, so, so the way it's sort of working, it, looking here is that as the Bitcoin uh, issue no longer distracts the Chinese central authorities, it will become clear to more and more people in the know in China that, oh, hey, Bitcoin's being cleaned up. It's being given a very tacit, uh, you know, um, uh, wink and a nod by the Chinese authorities and we can get in early. That'll start some, some, more impetus into that, but because the exchanges won't be able to be doing pooling anymore, won't be allowed to be doing um, shorting or, or trading of Bitcoin, and will actually have to perform actual Bitcoin transactions, this will put some additional strain on the Bitcoin network, slow things down a bit in China, and some of those funds, uh, newly liberated, uh, by the uh, new year will turn into silver. And I say newly liberated because you have to understand that the Chinese central authorities uh, have to allow the uh, safety valve of a certain amount of money going out of their country. Uh, and they know that they're going to have this bleed until they change things and they're in the process of engineering that. But the bleed is reset every year with the Chinese New Year, which I think is the 28th, starts on the 28th of um, this month. And so after that, everybody in the country will have the um, uh, ability to have, I think, 50,000 yuan uh, able to be uh, uh, located offshore. So there will be a big push uh, for that to um, uh, be converted into something to get it out of the RMB and yuan, which is being devalued as we speak against the uh, rising dollar, just so China can think itself sort of staying a little bit competitive. And that coincides um, is an analysis with our forecast of these early dates in February where certain things are going to occur relative to the price of Bitcoin along the projection that you read in that last report. Uh, we're just now able to give through immediacy data specific dates when certain uh, um, uh, rises are expected. And that's also going to create this, uh, if you will, a spillover effect into silver. The the impact on gold is less. Uh, there's there's some, but the uh, impetus for uh, gold is um, is coming from a lot of different areas that seem to be more corporate. So the pressure on, on the gold supplies and stuff relative to what we see in our data and its price seems to be independent of the more popular move into Bitcoin and silver. Hmm. Yeah, and in the last report, uh, I mean, you're talking about $2 days, then $5 days, and, and $20 days in, in silver, and silver going to uh, $600 per ounce. And uh, that's pretty... Um, it, amazing, actually, as a silver bud, someone who has a lot of silver and you know owns a lot of mining shares. I mean, that's that's has huge implications. Uh, it does. It's going to be a really weird world uh, as that occurs. Um, it's going to affect everything from the uh, price of solar panels to you know uh, silver and medicines and this kind of thing. So there's a, a lot of different ramifications to that, uh, and it may actually be that what we're witnessing is a revaluation that begins in this century in which we have basically a destruction of the past in terms of how we view things. So in the past, we've always thought of silver as gold's poor cousin. And we may now come to think of silver as uh, uh, something that gold envies simply because it has uses that gold does not and will be consumed in, in those uses. And our... our um, uh, movement as humanity into those kinds of things that use silver is going to be increasing uh, at a very rapid rate. So the rate of increase and rate of destruction of silver is going to increase as well. We have stuff in our data sets that go to the point of silver being too precious to use as money in the 2020s, where wow. governments will, will basically declare silver to be an uh, extreme strategic resource and do everything they can on bended knees to get the population to dishoard uh, because we're desperate for it for technologies. This is, um, you know, give everybody a big heads up, uh, but um, 
uh, that period of time is going to be really interesting for uh, the technologies that will be coming out of all of these. Let's call them um, instead of high tech, let's call them hyper tech, uh, because it's one, it's the it's the next level stuff, right? It's way beyond computers and any of this kind of stuff. We're into talking um, anti gravity, temporal shift, you know, field uh, mechanics, all of this kind of thing. All of these machineries are going to require silver at incredible. Uh, uh, levels, which will actually force us to be um, uh, parsimonious, very, very uh, uh, stingy with how we use silver because it'll become so valuable. The world is just going to really shift uh, in some strange ways as we go forward here. Hmm. Wow. But it, well, as far as silver goes, the $600 an ounce is, is uh, seen as part of just the simply economic uh, degradation that we're facing over these next few years, bearing in mind that uh, we're at the end of all of these giant cycles and that... Um, the ability to, um, uh, let me see if I can phrase this in a way that's optimistic. Uh, if we can see where we are at historically, we, we can choose what elements of a historical rhyme we, we wish to express. If we're unaware of that, then we're at the mercy of our, our fate and our destiny, and we'll thrash around and express the widest possible echo of that uh, particular uh, period that we're, that we're echo- echoing temporally. So, And this is not the case, but if this were a period of time and it was an echo of a civil war, if we knew that we were facing that, we could, for instance, change our language, focus it, redirect it as a society, such that we didn't actually have to express the shooting each other part. But we could nonetheless work out all the other issues that are, that are usually resolved in those those periods it's an issue of, of knowing uh, where you are in of having a historical perspective with yourself in it most people don't but there's a number of uh, projects that are within the dark ops kind of things um you know the people living in holes re-engineering uh, uh crash space alien kind of uh, ships and so forth there's a number of projects in that world that are attempting to do just that so i personally have an element of hope here that we might be able to as i put it up level ourselves out of this current cycle but the current cycle has everything uh, degrading over these next three or four years within the uh, economy that's based on the the debt-based currencies, and we're seeing that now. We're seeing them push us by them, all the people that are in Davos, um, and, and are, you know, are there willingly, um, are pushing the rest of humanity towards this cashless vision they have, and that's not going to work. They think it's going really well for them now in India, and they don't have a clue what it's going to be like once the um, um, a confluence of events occur in March and from that point on. Then the folly of their ways will be seen quite clearly, and you'll start seeing the panic within our system here as the Federal Reserve realizes their Indian experiment has gone horribly, horribly, uh, fatally wrong for them. And it's that point in this um, in this part of 2017 that we see this uh, movement within the wealth going into Bitcoin, uh, gold, and silver that's entirely independent of what's going on in the debt-based currencies and all the debt-based equity mar- or shares markets because it's not equity. You don't have equity in there. Either. It's just a mutual exchange of debt. Uh, and so it's kind of this weird divergence or bifurcation, which we really wrote about in December's report. The way you put that up, leveling yourself, you know, out of the current situation, and it really comes down to just being educated and prepared. And I, I know that's something that you're very passionate about doing. You know, sharing this information with people. Um, one it's of the things, self-interest. You know, I, I'm not necessarily a good guy. I just don't want to live in a in a world full of a lot of people going absolutely batshit crazy if I don't have to. <laughs> you know. Well, I want to talk about the the world changing here. And something interesting, we're going to change topics, and uh, the, you're predicting a mini ice age uh, from 2025 through 2050. Obviously, this is against the mainstream narrative of mankind, mankind's significant impact on the environment causing global warming. You know, and what's coming up in your reports, uh, I, I've got to ask you, what, what leads you to think that we are going to face this ice age, and what is that going to look like? Well, here's the thing. Um, uh, I pride myself on being a self-taught engineer. Okay, I've built uh, sawmills. I've uh, engineered and crafted boats. Uh, worked with my father building boats since I was about five. So uh, when I see the stuff in the data sets, I don't just assume that it's going to happen. If there's a possibility that I'm seeing something in the data, I go and check it out if I can. Once I get done with looking at the report or with the data for the report, I go and say, okay, if this is to occur, then X, Y, and Z logically must be happening at this point. And so in the case of the Ice Age, way back in the uh, in 97, 1997, the first full run I did, I was looking for Stanford University Network. That was just my target stock I was going to go on because they were hot. There were a lot of retail people that were investing, I thought, at the time. And basically, I was going to get in the system and use the knowledge to buy some Sun University, Stanford University 
universe the um, uh, network uh, computing stock uh, and then sell it and make money. Well, the first thing that came back was vast quantities of information about our son having a disease, and which it brought back all this long-term data. Um, and I can go into why that was the case, but anyway, all the long-term data was focusing on uh, this ice age coming up. Now, I had... I, uh, I'm in my 60s, and I, I was born in the 50s, and during the 50s, there was a huge debate of all these scientists at the time as to whether we were going to flop Venus or going to go flop into an ice age and uh, go hot or go cold. Mm -hmm. And there were, uh, the uh, consensus at the time among people that really thought uh, about it pretty deeply was that we were going to oscillate back, forth, back, forth, but that so far, the planet had never, ever, ever flopped into a, um, uh, a Venus kind of stage because you never recover from those. And so the expectation is we were going to end up as an ice age. And it makes sense. If you just look at it, never in our human history have we ever, or never in history of the, on this planet has it ever been in a Venus-like condition. Mm -hmm. And also, then you can go and you can look at um, uh, the uh, proffered by the powers that be, that is to say, academically uh, supplied information from all of the uh, studies that we've paid for with our taxes over the years that show the climate data going back thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. And in fact, in, in their minds, hundreds of thousands of years. Now, I can sort of screw myself here and say I, I dispute many of their ice cores as being as old as they think they are, and I can prove why that's not the case. But nonetheless, my point is that those ice cores go back at least to the um, end of the previous ice age. And so if we look at those ice cores, we see that, hmm, uh, well, about 14... Um, uh, 36 through 1484, uh, which really prompted uh, Columbus's expedition more than people realize. There was a, a mini ice age back then. No humans were driving SUVs and stuff uh, at that period, but just before that ice age, what happened? Why we had huge amounts of carbon dioxide growth to levels that are almost what we have today. And as far as what we can determine from the ice field studies, we've had periods of time where there was higher levels of carbon dioxide than we have today, and it invariably leads to two things occurring. The oceans suck the carbon dioxide out of the air, and in for whatever reason, again, I can get into the mechanics of that, but, um, and then during that process, we go into an ice age. And it's happening all over again. Now, what's shocking me is how rapidly it's happening. I thought we had until uh, uh, late 2018 before we would have massive impacts on our food system. And that's occurring now. It's happened uh, these past two weeks in Europe to the point where they're now having to import fresh vegetables from North America because they've lost most of the vegetable crop in southern Europe that usually feeds northern Europe. And so this was, this was uh, two years early. Uh, earlier than our long-term data. Our long-term data is not so accurate in terms of when the details are. Long-term data is effective usually uh, from, uh, it runs to about 19 months out, but there's components in it that go out into multi-generational. And so when looking at it from way back in 97, I knew that we were looking at about 20 years, but which, you know, 2017, should have paid attention. Uh, but anyway, uh, I didn't know if it would be 20, 25, or whatever. And so uh, recently I'd expected some of these things to occur as forecast, uh, in uh, the, our data sets, but again in long-term data, and I didn't expect to see them until 2018. Well, they're showing up very early in 2017, which is not necessarily a good sign at one level, but at another level, at a social order level, it is fantastically good. And so let me divert for a second and say it is better for us as a so society here in North America that have been kept uh, mushrooms, uh, grown as mushrooms in the dark, you know, fed manure every day in terms of the information. It is far better for us to get slapped in the face hard with an iced up cold fish this year and to have that shock strike us uh, viscerally such that we get off of our collective butts and start reacting to it than it is for the Ice Age to creep up on us over these next two years while the powers that be are, are waning in their influence but nonetheless still able to influence the collective thought. So in my thinking, it's much better to have the powers that be have their climate warming chair kicked right out from underneath them as we actually have a you know, mega food crisis planet-wide because that's going to get everybody's attention and we'll get serious about this because if we don't, the uh, potential for... Um, uh, near species level extinction, uh, at least insofar as the developed world is concerned, uh, is very real. We may be squeezed by um, the ice for a number of years before the new lands appear into in decreasingly smaller areas uh, upon which we can live and hope to exist. Need not be that way. If we know what we're facing, we can get uh, hard about it and get onto it now. But if we don't, we won't make any preparations, and then we'll simply have to react. Hmm. But you have to. We have to say to ourselves, "The Bosphorus is frozen over." Uh, that uh, doesn't happen that often. You don't have sea traffic going through the Bosphorus Straits. Uh, we have ice, uh, two major rivers in Hungary are frozen, Danube and uh, the Tennessee. Sea. We've got uh, northern Europe frozen. We've got uh, snow in places in Spain that have never had it before, and it's record snow causing buildings to fall over. We've got huge winds that are destroying greenhouses in Holland as we speak. Uh, England is under the coldest winter ever. We've got uh, Venice frozen, frozen over, the canals. The, even, the, even the lagoon in Venice is frozen over. And as forecast, by the way, I, I noted 
in one of the recent reports that pretty soon it was going to be just uh, the only places that had flowing water were those areas that had it next to the sewage. Now, also bear in mind something about Venice. If the freeze continues because of the age of their pipes having never, ever been frozen before, when it thaws, they will find that they don't have water in Venice anymore flowing anywhere, and it's nothing but sewage dumping out everywhere as they try and recover four- and five-hundred-year-old piping systems. Wow. This is going to happen all throughout um, uh, the, uh, the region there. We've had people in Bangladesh that are filling their hospitals because they don't have uh, warmth. Same thing. We've had people in India, and Pakistan, and um, uh, Kashmir, and uh, southern China that are having to relocate simply because they don't have protection against extreme cold. So uh, this is the, uh, the supposedly the warmest year ever, and that you know the the recently as, as six months ago, uh, the Democratic. Uh, National Convention people were saying they needed to use the RICO Act against people like myself that are saying that there's an ice age coming and that I was somehow perpetrating a fraud. And I would say that, well, when you lose 80 to 90 percent of the vegetables in Spain and northern Italy uh, all in a one-week period of time due to uh, flash freezing, that's part of an ice age, and I'm not the one committing the fraud. Mm. Wow. Well, I mean, serious implications, but, I mean, you you make the case for it, especially what's going on in Europe and around the world any indications as to what we could see here in the united states in areas like california texas and you know florida areas that you know are pretty we, mild we in terms of cold year. i say we may skate this year but the uh, pattern is going to change so it's not going to be um uh, so like people in texas are thinking oh okay it's extremely uh, warm and wet there at the moment because of the um uh the current uh quasi monsoon that's dumping and it's very uh, has been very uh, uh cold and and uh, then wet up here in the northwest but uh as part of the same uh um atmospheric river that's coming in but the new pattern is going to be what we're seeing in spain and that is to say giant uh, atmospheric rivers uh, rivers in the sky is how i put it in the reports years ago the rivers and lakes in the sky are going to come along and dump on us and a river in the sky is different from a lake in the sky because a river might just dump on you for days and days and days and days until it's exhausted but our problem is going to be that these these rivers except in like uh, tahoe and the mountains of california they're not bringing snow they're just going to bring water but the uh, polar the pole to pole heat distribution that goes along with these kind of storms is such that as these giant rivers empty out over land, they will then, if you want to think about it in a sort of a simplified way, they're going to suck down cold air from the poles. And so these areas are going to freeze over. This is what's happened to Europe. First they were flooded out and then everything froze. So the crops and everything are ruined because there was no snow protection. The snow actually insulates strawberries and this kind of thing, right? And lettuce and, and spinach and all these small crops. But you get a flood in there and then the uh, the water freezes, the roots are, are damaged, and that's it. Uh, so that's what we're seeing. So I suspect, just because the data has been saying that for a number of years, that that would be the pattern that would hit here as well. And that we're actually going to see uh, diaspora, the movement of, of people here in North America relative to weather. Uh, we're seeing it already, some of the impacts, for instance, in uh, the Yukon, um, in uh crushed up ice, or not even crushed up ice, there's this weird situation going on now in many of the far north rivers where they're flowing, they're flowing ice crystals, and if you, and this is also happening in Europe, and if you stick something into that river, uh, that's, uh, even if it's warmer, uh, than the, uh, outside, than the river temperature, the ice, the, the flowing ice crystals will just grab it as though it was a hand and suck it into the river, they'll freeze around it almost instantly. And so you can set a cup of hot coffee in a ceramic mug, uh, in this, uh, bit of ice, and everything freezes instantly, with the hot coffee still being hot temporarily. Wow. And, it, and there's a huge giant block of ice forming around it. That's screwing up all kinds of, um, power transmission, bridges, this sort of thing. Also in Venice, we've got the situation where the, uh, piazzas are freezing, the ice is pushing the, um, Venice isn't built on land, every, all the Houses are built on pilings. They're starting to push the buildings and the bridges and everything apart from each other. And so this is the expectation that we're going to face this for at least, you know, um, most probably, I would think, uh, the next 30 to 40 years of your life and your generation. So you guys have got to get, uh, you know, we've got to get serious about dealing with this and planning for how we're going to cope with these kind of things. Well, this is going to be a complete curveball to uh, conventional wisdom, conventional understanding, considering what... You know, we all understand and, you know, hear from the mainstream media, which is we're getting hotter. That's <laughs> this ice age information is not, is not being told to the, the average person. And it's going to be such a major shock. And then you throw in the economic collapse on the horizon. It's just this huge perfect storm that, that's on its way. It's just that way, too, though, for the 1930s. And if we look at it, it's a temporal echo. 
the echo we're in now is actually more of an echo of 1918 and the period of time uh, which was the collapse of globalism at that period, okay? Uh, but combined within there is all of the stuff that it went through the 30s and the 40s, the war cycles and all of that. We're in this echo. So, But we're up-leveling because we have so many more people. So instead of having the Dust Bowl to contend with, and there's a whole lot of people that will tell you in the 1950s, hey, 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 this Dust Bowl we just had is a sure sign of an ice age. You get this stuff happening before every giant ice age. Giant areas of drought, and it's all uh, connected in this in this thermocycle that moves heat around the planet from the equators up to the poles, and this all occurs because of the sun. So for a period of time, you are warmer. Just before all of the ice ages, even in the Maunder Minimum, just before that period of time, things become very idyllic in terms of their temperatures, and then they get a little bit too idyllic, a little too hot, and then and then boom, it starts crashing into the cold, and it and it has to do with uh, basically how our planet takes heat from the uh, sun gathering areas and moves it up to the poles. So yes, this is going to be um, uh, disruptive, but the narrative that, that I'm saying, uh, stating now relative to the Ice Age is actually supportive of a lot of the economic stuff we've seen, where um, a Bitcoin, for instance, is going to be used as a, a cross-border settlement uh, method because it won't require moving physical goods, which will be uh, increasingly difficult for a few years during the Ice Age uh, um, aspect of what we have to deal with here. Now, on top of this, of course, I have to point out we're in the midst of a giant energy crises, and we just don't know it yet, and that that's going to contribute to uh, the giant crash uh, or a confluence of forces here, not a crash, but a, um, a confluence of forces that are putting pressure on humanity such that we will uh, stand up, um, no gender uh, offense here implied at all, man up and face the future and get on with things, because here's where we're at. When they first started drilling oil wells in the late 1800s in Michigan, they were getting a 500 return, 500 to one return uh, in energy. So for every uh, instantly, I mean almost uh, staggeringly instantly, for every uh, uh, barrel of oil they put into drilling, they would instantly get 500 back, and they were able to maintain that 500 ratio out of that well for years. Uh, even the best we can do with our fracking and our high tech and all of this, which is a negative net energy return, because we don't ever calculate the cost of these new technologies in terms of what it takes to actually build the slant drills and all of this kind of thing. But even the best they can do is a five to one return on investment, uh, calorie for calorie or BTU for BTU in, in petroleum. And our society does not function on anything less than about 15. At, at 12, we could survive, but at 15, we can sort of grow about maybe one or two percent per year. So the Fed, Federal Reserve is fighting a losing battle here. They'll never be able to get growth out of a, a population that isn't growing and an energy supply that isn't growing. And at the same time, we now have an, a, a, a depletion of energy because we're facing economic or, or environmental conditions. They're going to want to suck more BTUs out of us each and every year uh, as the, the climate becomes harsher and harsher until eventually we give up and move south. And even that requires more BTUs out of us just to relocate and to try and reestablish and so on. So, and, and it won't necessarily work because there's no guarantee that the glaciation patterns that we're going to see in the future are going to match those of the past. And in fact, a lot that will argue they won't, but we'll have to contend with it as we go along. This is not seriously doom and gloom because there's sort of benefits to this. Uh, I won't see them because I won't live long enough, but in your lifetime, 